afternoon, and welcome to today's event. My name is Nathalie laviadez Jodoin. I'm Vice President, Public Sector Operations and Inclusion at the Canada School of Public Service. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Their culture and presence have nurtured this land and continue to nurture this land. I recognize that we all work in different places and therefore encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize the territory you are occupying. According to its mission to include learning inside of the culture of the public service of Canada, the School of Public Service invited Justin Bourgon to encourage new ideas and offer an external perspective about the priority, priority questions. The name of this initiative is uh, is honoring the work of Justine Bonbouco and help us to recognize our extraordinary work in the public service in Canada and internationally. Able to continue delivering quality cutting edge learning content while building stronger links and partnerships with academia. With that, I would like to welcome Madame Jocelyne Bourgon to provide some remarks. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. C'est uh, un honneur d'être associé. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be associated to that initiative and to get the opportunity to say some words. Because the influence, the way we frame issues, the solution that will be found, and results that will be achieved. And periodically, ideas come to the fore and replace others because they are better aligned to emerging circumstances. We live in such a time. The world over, public sector leaders are exploring ideas to ensure that their public institutions are fit for the challenges of the 21st century. A time characterized by increasing complexity, existential threats like climate change, high impact events like pandemics, and other global risks like a war in Europe. There is more to the field of public administration than the inner workings of public organization. Public administrations transform ideas about life in society into a reality that we experience collectively. So the question is, what ideas, some old and some new, would help ensure that the public service of Canada will keep pace with the increasing complexity of the world we live in? The Visiting Scholar Initiative of the Canada School is an invitation to academic thought leaders and public sector leaders to engage in exploratory conversation about the powerful ideas that would help ensure that the public service of Canada is fit for the challenges ahead. It's an invitation that is made for leaders of diverse disciplines academic, the humanity, bien sûr, but également les domaines. That is helping us to explore with the leader with the leaders of the public service new ideas that could help us to face the great challenges that we face with in the 21st century so see what we aspire to build what it may mean to be a citizen of this country in the future nos attentes pour la fonction publique du canada this first lecture is an important step because it sets the tone for powerful conversation about the public service that Canada will need to successfully navigate through an accelerating period of time. Je suis profondément reconnaissante que le président de l'École de fonction publique du Canada grateful that the president of the Canada School of Public Service started that initiative and I really thank him for letting me be a part of it. Thank you to all. Thank you very much, Madame Bourgon, for your remarks. C'est maintenant pour Public Services inaugural, Jocelyne Bourgon, visiting scholar. Rachel is a lawyer, senior research fellow, and assistant professor at St. Mary's University in the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies. <laughs> 
Dr. Zellers has facilitated countless critical implicit bias sessions for government leaders and management, both provincially and federally, since 2014. She is widely recognized for her abilities to center local historical contexts, locate implicit bias within living histories of anti-Blackness, and address barriers to personal and structural change with pointedness and vision. The Call to Action on Anti-Racism, Equity, and Inclusion in the Public Service, released in January 2021 by the Clerk of the Privy Council, directed leaders across the Federal Public Service to take practical actions that will be the basis for systemic change. The events in 2020 precipitated deep reflection on the unjust treatment of Black people, other racialized groups, and Indigenous peoples in our society, and our clerk stressed the urgency of removing systemic racism from our institutions and from our culture. Au cours de son mandat, Rachel a inspiré les dirigeants à vivre leur Rachel engagement. Rachel inspired the leaders to leave their engagement by encouraging continuous learning and asking leaders to start powerful conversation and actions to provoke change. Doing so, she started a big wave in the public service by asking key questions and inviting us to start to talk about hard, hard topics. One of the subjects was the merit and anti-Black racism. As a lot of you know, merit is considered as a very important part of the federal Fun federal service. It, ex it requires transparency at all levels. It asks leaders to recruit people coming from indigenous or black communities or other races or other um, discriminated group. But this raised some discussions around the merit of those groups. Rich, continue to be questioned on the basis of merit. In line with the spirit of the Visiting Scholar Initiative, Rachel's capstone project on merit and anti-Blackness will undoubtedly spur reflection and, let's hope, meaningful change towards a public service that is equipped to meet the current and future needs of Canada and that reflects the rich diversity of Canadians. Without further ado, Please welcome Dr. Rachel Sellers. In the spring of 2022, a black woman named Kentaji Brown Jackson was nominated to the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest and most powerful judiciary in the US. Her appointment was historic because she was the first black woman nominated in the court's 230 year history. But her appointment was also historic for a number of other important reasons. She is supremely qualified for the Supreme Court with credentials from Harvard twice and breathtaking judicial experience. She is also notably the first nominee in history who has served as a public defender. In short, no one currently on the Supreme Court can touch her qualifications and experience. By contrast, the last nominated judge, Amy Coney Barrett, a white woman, had only briefly served as a judge before her nomination, had never worked in government as a prosecutor, as a defense lawyer, a solicitor general, an attorney general, and in fact, had never served as counsel to any legislative body. Her judicial record prior to being nominated by Donald Trump in 2020 is best described as wholly unexceptional for a justice. As numerous political writers noted at the time, she was the most inexperienced person nominated to the Supreme Court in three decades. Still, 
During Judge Brown Jackson's nomination hearings, Republican senators attacked her merit in ways so fantastic, so counterfeit, that conservative institutions and media loudly noted the dishonesty. Demagogic, one former prosecutor wrote, incessantly and painfully over two days, the Supreme Court's first black female nominee was accused of assisting child pornographers and child rapists as her young daughters and husband sat silently behind her. In the end, the leader of the Republican Party concluded that Kentanji Brown Jackson simply did not have the necessary merit to serve on the most powerful court in the US. But why? Why was this bar raised so impossibly high for a Black woman with more relevant experience than anybody else currently serving on the U.S. Supreme Court? The answer is a rather easy one. The nomination hearing of the first Black woman to the highest court in the United States reminds us that merit is not a fixed in stone or step-by-step -step procedure but rather an idea, a guiding principle. And merit, I insist, is best understood, most clearly and concretely understood by its greatly uneven and discriminatory application as a study of the history of merit in public service illustrates. Yes, yes, merit is always guidance about qualifications or excellence or skills most relevant for a position. As the Public Service Commission has noted, for most Canadians in the early 20th century, merit became shorthand for the competitive examination. But merit is, in reality, both an institutional safeguard and algorithm administered by those in power, reflective of the social norms and dominant modalities of discrimination in our society. Merit is historically malleable and unsettled. As such, the, the merit bar will be lifted high for those who face the, the greatest discrimination in a society, just as it was for Judge Kintanji Brown Jackson, because merit is not a concrete category, as so many mistakenly insist. Rather, merit is shaped well within the circle, inside of our racially unjust and discriminatory society, within our microcosmic institutions, rather than outside of it. And merit is shaped by all of the biases, unintentional and intentional, that live inside all of us. Merit has also proven to be a powerful and distracting dog whistle when institutions are confronted with demands for racial equity. Many have overheard colleagues express concerns with the quality of merit in conversations about expansive diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives such as the call to action on anti-racism, equity, and inclusion in the federal public service. When communicated in this context, the intimation is that targeted recruitments or other intentional initiatives to increase the numbers of black leaders and public servants, as one example, will not only negatively impact merit, but also disadvantage white public servants and lower the quality of public service as a whole. Here, the term merit stands in for perceived unfair advantage to black employees and applicants. As departmental responses to the call to action have blossomed, so have suggestions that equitable policies, greater racial representation in leadership, and reckoning with the history of anti-blackness will somehow diminish or lessen the sturdiness of merit in public service. To be clear, this tactic is not new. Rather, it is one that is commonly used to silence complaints of harm or abuse, or simply assertions of fundamental charter rights from those most marginalized in public service. Over the last century, the merit principle in public service has served as a deeply imperfect ideal. At times used expansively and even discriminatorily, it is also always a reflection of our times. But I'm a researcher. I'm interested in the unique way 
that merit has been used over the last century to exclude Black Canadians from public service during the very moments when their inclusion should have been an easy consideration in light of all of the accommodations historically made for other groups of Canadians. We don't talk very much about how public service came to be or how it was changed over the last century. As someone who's been a gracious visitor to public service and a research fellow and public scholar at the Canada School of Public Service, I've often wondered how competitions became the way that most public servants get hired. And then also how merit became the governing standard of evaluation for hiring and promotion. These questions seem all the more important in light of our current moment, one in which the nation's largest employer for the first time in history is undergoing systems-wide changes designed to advance those who have not been in its top leadership positions before. Changes that, as the call to action states, are designed to do better by ensuring that government is putting the full capacity of our entire pool of talent at the service of Canadians. Public service as a profession predates 1908 and has come a long way since the first Civil Service Act of 1868. For example, in the 19th century, ministers did what they wanted. And although competition was a guiding principle, as one scholar notes, public service provided an examination so rudimentary that only the completely illiterate failed. The Civil Service Acts of 1882 and 1908 aimed to do much better. These two amended acts set out to confront another enormous foundational challenge to public service. That is the problem of patronage. Patronage by definition is an exchange of political favors, a form of political nepotism, if you will. But it was above all things, the first preferential quota system in public service that white Canadian men, dominantly Anglophone, directly and almost exclusively benefited from. Beginning in 1882 with the McInnes Royal Commission, two components of public service were borrowed from the British system and made our own. The first was open competitive examinations. And then secondly, merit, specifically hiring and promotion by merit. The notion of merit was based on the liberal belief that a man, literally a white man, must have the ability to succeed or fail according to his own efforts and abilities. Merit was also an attempt to safeguard public service from accusations of political partisanship and unbridled patronage. As one historian writes, 19th century liberalism depended on healthy white male bodies that could work, consume, govern themselves and others. These ideal liberal bodies were the same ones that were assumed to make up Canada's civil service. The commission authors archived their thoughts and intentions in 1881, and they were deeply concerned about the impacts of discrimination and preferential treatment on the self-esteem and performance of young white men entering public service at the turn of the century, men who were not given the opportunity to compete and earn promotions based alone on their hard work and abilities become discouraged. They lose their self-respect and hope for the future, they wrote. Such injustice, they added, destroys all incentive to emulation and all desire to excel. Despite this awareness and warnings, the system of patronage continued. And so in 1907, another Royal Commission was formed led by John Courtney, Deputy Minister of Finance in the Laurier government. During this time, the Courtney Commission introduced the quality of public service that has been long touted as a truism. Public service is where you make your career. It's where your options are boundless and also where choice serves as an expression of protection an agency where under continual appraisement, as the commissioners wrote in 1907, one should be eligible for promotion to any position, to any division of the public service. Again, the commission authors emphasized the creation of a service that would not discourage or psychologically deter young men of great efficiency from swiftly moving up the ranks of public service. 
To safeguard these values and best prevent political nepotism, on September 1st, 1908, the Public Service Commission, then called the Civil Service Commission, was born. In 1908, merit, as one scholar writes, was shorthand for a new method to staff the public service. But the principle was never easily defined. The next series of amendments to the Civil Service Act that took place in 1918 squarely addressed the continuing problem of patronage, political nepotism. The act attempted to establish a universal merit system by making all recruitment the responsibility of a truly independent civil service commission, responsible only to parliament. Still, this amended act did not explicitly define merit or the merit principle. The categories of those deemed meritorious and unmeritorious, who belongs and who does not, are never hard to determine. In fact, these categories are always very easy to ascertain because they're bound within a nation's history and all of its bundles of silences, as historian Michel Rotrio might say, that are essential to the status quo. The application of merit, I've learned, is a clarifying prism of all that is amiss with us humans and our tendencies to see and treat some people more or less important, some better, smarter, capable, and more included than others. At the start of the 20th century, women, Black and Indigenous Canadians, and to a lesser degree, French Canadians were not welcome in public service. But it would be wrong to simply conflate these groups together as mere outsiders to public service. White women and French Canadians indeed had an early yet diminished presence in government at the turn of the 20th century. As Kathleen Archibald notes in her influential study, Sex and the Public Service, between 1901 and 1967, the percentage of women in public service expanded from 2% to 27% of all public servants. Black and indigenous people were simply excluded. Black and indigenous peoples are part of this nation's founding violence, the, the violence of settler colonialism, genocide, and slavery that Canada relied upon over centuries. And this radical exclusionary violence was foundational to the public service as well. Such violence against black public servants has remained a dis interested subject and unyielding logic, despite all of the ways that merit has been changed, broadened and accommodated to make way for various groups of white Canadians over the last century. The much more difficult questions regarding the principle of merit are this, how and why have its categories shifted over time? If merit is, as I insisted at the start, unfixed, malleable, unsettled, then what role does it play in shaping institutions? And with the call to actions forward facing approach to confronting anti blackness in the public service, what might a study of merit reveal about the particular intractability of anti blackness over the last 100 years? The, the history of the flexibility in application of merit in public service provides a brilliant starting point for answering these questions and specifically the treatment of merit in relationship to Canadian veterans, women and French Quebecers is illustrative of the design to exclude black Canadians from participation in public service. After the First World War, preferential access was given to veterans for jobs in the federal civil service and over time, 55,000 veterans benefited from this measure to help them reintegrate into society. However, as scholars have noted, this meant that women were discriminated against at the same time that veterans were given special privileges that also ranked them ahead of more meritorious non-veterans on eligibility lists. The justification for this preferential treatment was a really important one as citizens were demanded of more by the state, more demands were made upon the state by its citizens and access to public service or a guarantee of employment became this offering. During the war, the state asked and eventually legislated 
that its citizens die for its service, one scholar explained. As a result, three preferred categories of individuals were created. Pensioned veterans who had been injured during the war were given priority. Secondly, veterans who'd been on active duty. And thirdly, widows of soldiers killed during the war. Disabled veterans were granted first preference, resulting in a higher placement on the eligibility list from which public servants were hired when there was an opening. Not only did the government create preferred categories that contradicted merit, but also a ranking system allowed a veteran who received a minimum passing mark to be prioritized above non-veterans who received better scores. This preferential schema both contradicted and diminished the principle of merit by ensuring that the most qualified candidates by way of competition certainly would not always be chosen. This preferential category broadened the definition of merit. However, I wanna push this analysis a bit further. The decision to prioritize male veterans who'd been injured in war created a preferential category that amplified both the acceptance of discrimination broadly in public service as well as the cardinal character of anti-Blackness within public service. Here's what I mean. Black Canadians have been part of this nation since the 17th century, creating communities, sacred institutions, and distinct cultures from coast to coast to coast. Black Canadians served in the First and Second World Wars by the thousands, yet they were excluded from the veterans preference category for the same positions in public service promised to white veterans. To briefly highlight a well-known example, over 800 black men served with the number two construction battalion during the First World War, and another 700 joined other units and served overseas. This last figure is important, given the extreme prejudice that existed with those in charge of military enlistment during the First World War. As historian Melissa Shaw writes in her article about the number two battalion, when local commanding officers denied this fundamental privilege of citizenship to black men, black Canadians responded directly by using a variety of political activist methods and strategies to articulate their demands for full inclusion in the Canadian expeditionary forces. Canadians such as Oliver Johnson, born in 1892 in Oakville, Ontario, he was drafted in 1918 arrived in England the next year, and was posted to the 8th Reserve Battalion. He was discharged in August of 1919 and unable to find steady employment back at home. As his biographer wrote, as with many veterans after the First World War, work was very hard to find, especially if you were Black. Canadians also, like Jeremiah Jones of East Mountain, Nova Scotia, who listed with the 106th Battalion in 1916 and was injured in the Battle of Vimy Ridge in 1917, where 10,000 soldiers died. He, he was discharged from the Army in 1918. And despite his service and permanent injuries, he was not prioritized for a position in public service. Historian Kathy Grant estimates that between three and 4,000 Black Canadians served in the First and Second World Wars. But these thousands of veterans returned to communities where they faced segregation and discrimination in every area of social life, especially employment. These proud men were not afforded preferential access for jobs in the federal civil service, as were white veterans. Were black women hired into good permanent positions in public service after their husbands were killed in battle so they could become breadwinners for their children? Or were their children taken away when they felt indigent in a society that failed to evenly honor its promises during a time of great scarcity, as was the case with countless Black women in the early 20th century? This, for instance, was the reality for Louise Little, the French-speaking mother of Malcolm X, who had worked in Montreal before migrating to the United States. As Melissa Shaw concludes, after the war, 
many black Canadians were forced to come to terms with the reality of race politics in Canada. They had helped to win the war, but in their efforts to do so, they lost vital home front battles. Many also felt as though they had conceded to Jim Crow in the military. The war, she added, gave them a clear understanding of Canada as a particular type of racialized state. The principle of merit expanded widely to create a preferential category for white Canadian veterans and their widows during the First World War. But black men, black men served Canada and paid her with their bodies and lives too. Yet for these black veterans, the, the bar of merit was raised impossibly high in order to prevent black men and their families from receiving the material benefits the state designated for white veterans. It is very tempting to relegate this history to a bygone era of Canadian racial intolerance, but I want to encourage us to think of this lineage of trauma in both subjective and material terms. History is littered with examples of disproportionate black disadvantage and denial during times of social crises, where the state has specifically created welfare benefits meant to directly ameliorate the suffering and losses of its citizens. The $30 million Halifax Relief Commission Fund established in the aftermath of the 1917 Halifax explosion is one well-known example. The 1935 Social Security Act in the United States is another. In both examples, Black citizens were categorically excluded from receiving these benefits at a tremendous cost that stretched well beyond one generation. And so history reminds us that in these moments when Black people within a nation state are cast well beyond the circle of citizenry, racial discrimination is reified and strengthened at both the institutional and individual levels. In short, Black people's rightful claims as citizens have not been honored throughout history. And these material exclusions augment the economic losses and poverty of Black survivors in the decades following across generations. This too was the case with the veterans' preference in public service. What did the withholding of jobs cost vulnerable Black veterans and their families? in financial terms. How does one begin to rightly measure those losses over time and generations? And in light of the corrective measures the call to action sets out to undertake, how does one meaningfully correct this part of our history? What is certain is that Prime Minister Robert Borden knew at the end of the war that his countrymen were still not prepared to grant equality to substantial numbers of black men. Yet his archival papers from 1918 point to something more insidious as well. His intention to keep black Canadians out of public service. In a correspondence with cabinet minister Francis Kiefer, Prime Minister Borden refers to black people as a backward race and adds that he greatly feared the difficulty of dealing with the colored population who, if brought into federal service, would probably desire and perhaps insist upon representation in parliament. The history of diversity, equity, and inclusion in public service has been often communicated as a competition between the sexes over the last century, men and women, disabled veterans at the expense of women, and those who had lost their husbands to the war. But these polarized categories have created a fragmentary narrative of diversity in public service, one that has obscured its treatment of black Canadians, as well as the birdcage of discrimination shaped by our history over centuries. It has also again and again reintroduced a one dimensional notion of black life into public service, one that made the humanity of a black disabled man or a black disabled French speaking employee beyond the imagination. And yet we have in all of our fullness always been right here. From its inception, 
the Civil Service Commission openly deny the merit of white women and acknowledge that their policies were based on sexual prejudice. White women who were hired were disproportionately confined to the lowest positions in public service at the time, primarily clerical positions. This was intentionally designed to make public service more attractive to male candidates and to also allow male clerks to move up the hierarchy free of competition from equally, and in some cases, much more qualified female candidates. These actions were designed to preserve the status quo and not disrupt the patriarchal norms that existed outside of public service as well as within it. As one scholar notes, the feminization of clerical work at the lowest ranks of public service established and reified the place of women within government early on. It also made a myth of the idea that a career in public service led to unlimited opportunities and advancements by way of one's own talents, hard work, and abilities. The messaging was really clear. Women could be as brilliant and hardworking as they wanted, but they assuredly would never have the same opportunities as white men. As one scholar insightfully noted, the, the confinement of white women to clerical work and entry-level positions also incentivized the recruitment of white men into the middle and senior ranks of public service from outside of public service. Again, public service reflected the stereotypes and discriminatory socio-sexual norms of its time, a time when women were encouraged never to travel alone and were thought to be too fragile to carry heavy boxes or files as part of their jobs. In its very first report to parliament, the Civil Service Commission observed that women were much more eager to work in government in all of its divisions for the salaries the government was willing to pay, yet they were excluded from the higher first and second divisions and felt the negative effects of the disregard for their merit as applied to their skills, talents, and sex. Although they were hired in large numbers during the first and second world wars, they remained confined to the lowest levels of service and were unjustly expected to vacate their positions in favor of returning veterans. All of this, despite the government's own reporting that there are women who have quite as good executive abilities as men and who might on the mere grounds of personal qualification, fill the higher positions of public service. These women, they wrote, were well qualified on the grounds of ability alone to fill the position. Restrictions for women continued despite the increased numbers that entered public service during the war. In 1921, for example, women were barred from permanent positions and were forced to resign as soon as they married. This legal provision lasted until 1955. Systems-wide changes began in the 1960s when the Public Service Employment Act of 1967 added sex to the grounds of prohibited discrimination in relation to the right to prescribe selection standards. In 1974, marital status and age were also added and an Office of Equal Opportunity for Women was opened. Two historic reports, a Royal Commission on the Status of Women and a paper entitled Sex and the Public Service had great influence in galvanizing government support for institutional changes for women. The Public Service Commission also committed itself to increasing both the number of women in public service as well as the number of women in leadership positions. As such, it built upon or created three affirmative action incentives to support this goal. First, it involved more women in the career assistance program. Secondly, it made sure that women's volunteer experiences were rated in the same manner as other relevant experience. And thirdly, it developed new small courses for women while removing any male only restrictions from career areas. It is striking that these policies developed over time and particularly through the 1960s did not center black and racialized women in any meaningful capacity. In the 1960s, the nation was home to more than 30,000 black Canadians. 
between 1955 and 1965, federal and provincial departments recruited black women from the West Indies and to blue collar and to a lesser extent, semi-professional positions in places like Montreal. Importantly, by 1965, Quebec was home to 2,000 French-speaking Haitian men and women, highly skilled and educated doctors, nurses, technicians, professors, and writers who'd migrated from Haiti. As white women entered the workforce in greater numbers between 1930 and 1960 to undertake professionalized gendered work as clerks and secretaries, a shortage of domestic workers arose throughout the country. And so, beginning in 1955, the Department of Citizenship and Immigration implemented the West Indian domestic scheme and recruited 3,000 primarily middle-class and educated Black women to work in the homes of wealthy white Canadians with the allure of citizenship eligibility after five years. As many scholars of this history have documented, Black women were mundanely paid far less than the minimum wage, worked in decently long hours, and were subject to racial and sexual violence as the norm. As scholar Robin Maynard has noted, in a multicultural era where race could no longer be openly used to deny labor rights to non-white workers, immigration status served the same purpose. Where were the comparable affirmative action initiatives for the many thousands of Black Canadian, French-speaking Haitian, and West Indian women that Canada had recruited into temporary positions? Where were the equivalency incentives for Black women's domestic service as had been similarly provided to allow white women to seamlessly enter public service? Were highly educated and experienced Haitian women hired into top government positions? During our moment, where departments are scrambling to collect disaggregated data sets for the first time in the history of the public service, one might ask, where is the government data that documented the great demographic diversity for these large numbers of Black women in Canada in the 1960s? Out of the dozens of consultants who provided qualitative and quantitative information to the Royal Commission on the Status of Women, and with nearly 500 consultations. The authors included no information by or about black women, nor consulted with any of the hundreds of black led organizations, community centers and churches that existed throughout Canada in 1970. Although consultations were made in Quebec, no efforts were made to include the voices of Haitian women, many of whom were visible organizers and leaders in their communities. Kathleen Archibald's much cited study does make brief mention of black people. But here, black people appear only as a prop to, to bolster the case for a research category entitled the typical effect of discrimination on earnings. In a few lines, the author employs a tactic commonly employed by white feminists of the era. The comparison of racial discrimination experienced by the Negro in order to highlight and validate discrimination faced by white women on the basis of sex. In the end, black women's lives remain wholly invisible within this formative study in public service. As one scholar summarized, women and veterans represent two groups of potential employees that expose the contested nature of merit. For black women, however, these histories foreshadow how high the bar of merit would be raised for them in the future. If white male bodies were the ideal civil servant, they were also initially imagined as Anglophone. While white men were deemed meritorious in public service, the higher levels of employment were historically reserved for those with advanced and university education access that was unobtainable to large numbers of French Quebecers in the early 20th century. One scholar notes that this approach contained a not so subtle class bias. 
but also clear regional and language biases because of the underdeveloped nature of higher education in Quebec and also other provinces in the early 20th century. Additionally, public service exams continued very much to reflect the Anglo-American tradition, even translated into French, making it difficult for those growing up in the more classic French system in Quebec to compete. In Canada, wealth, access, and a long history of domination by the British and Catholic Church converged to create enormous educational, social, and class disparities between French Canadians and English-speaking Canadians before the Quiet Revolution. And these same discriminatory tensions, like those of race, were mapped into the infrastructure of public service and the principle of merit. In short, class and linguistic biases were also founding biases within public service. In 1969, in fact, the authors of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism documented the precipitous decline of the French-speaking proportion of the total public service after the establishment of the Civil Service Commission. Francophones, they wrote, made up about 22% of all federal employees in 1918, but less than 13% in 1946. Over time, this lessened representation was also seen in the senior ranks of public service. This area of history reveals a challenge that merit has continually faced within public service. The attempt to get rid of one kind of discrimination here, patronage, produced another, that is a shrinking representation of French Canadians in public service. In 1966, Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson famously stated that the linguistic and cultural values of the English-speaking and French-speaking Canadians will be reflected through civil service recruitment and training. A few years later, this sentiment was also endorsed by Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau when he noted that Canadians whose mother tongue is French should be adequately represented in the public service, both in terms of numbers and in levels of responsibility. On February 1st, 1966, the Civil Service Commission announced that bilingualism would be a merit factor in appointments in the national capital area. Second language skills or the willingness to acquire them within a given period of time through language training at public expense would be an element of merit. Three years later, in 1969, the Federal Official Languages Act made French and English the official languages of Canada. Yet it is clear that the French speakers these prime ministers and royal commission authors had in mind were white. Despite a racially diverse French population in Canada in the 1960s, and there is of course one diverse French speaking population that was integral to Quebec's social and economic growth in the 60s and 70s, at the very time that Quebec was in need of qualified French-speaking professionals. The arrival of elite Haitians, doctors, nurses, technicians, professors, and writers, occurred at a time when the province was undergoing radical changes associated with the Quiet Revolution. By 1967, Montreal alone was home to 131 Haitian doctors, 10 times the number of Haitian psychiatrists than in Port-au-Prince, and more Haitian nurses in, in Canada than in the Haitian capital. As historian Sean Mills has noted, the first wave of Haitian migrants, highly educated and possessing technical and professional skills that were very much in demand, integrated relatively well into a rapidly transforming Quebec society. In the 1960s, Quebec's public and parapublic sectors grew rapidly. They were in need of qualified personnel. And so its institutions welcomed the arrival of highly skilled and educated Haitians. Quebec recognized their professional qualifications. And by 1965, more than 2,000 Haitians lived in Quebec. Haitians in the 1960s were generally sympathetic to Quebec's nationalism. This perhaps surprising kinship arises from a history that stands alone in the 400 year history of the transatlantic slave trade. Haitian people led the only successful insurrection against their white enslavers beginning in 1791. As one Haitian writer living in Montreal in the 60s explained so clearly, since we believed in the self-determination of peoples 
we could not but be sympathetic to the nationalist cause in Quebec. Yet history does not reveal such reciprocity in the context of French Canadian struggles for inclusion and representation within public service, either from inside or outside of government. This, despite the tremendous social, cultural, and economic contributions that Haitians made to Quebec during its own quiet revolution. And why? How do we together understand the complexities of discrimination encountered by French Canadians within the nation and within public service? The complex relationship between French Quebecers and Haitians and the exclusion of Haitians from public service. All of this at the very moment that advocacy for their participation would have seemed integral. Here's one angle. French Quebecers, as historian Sean Mills argues, have always maintained what he refers to as a liminal position within the nation. On the one hand, he writes, they could be racialized and marginalized by more powerful interests, namely Anglophone Canada and the British. But on the other hand, they nonetheless possess the power and privilege of whiteness and an attendant paternalism towards black peoples, both at home and abroad, as Quebec's extensive missionary history in Haiti evidences. When the quiet revolution began, it arose within the context of global anti-colonial movements, premised on a shared effort of displacing a structure power that Quebecers adopted as their own, Mills argues. French Canadians were themselves descendants of white colonizers. And despite insisting during the quiet revolution on being les nègres blancs, they were both by color and power white. When the Royal Commission of Bilingualism and Biculturalism submitted its final report and recommendations to the Canadian government, it did so with a shared understanding of whiteness, one that did not include Haitians within the categories of Francophone or French Canadian, and one importantly, that had no consideration for the participation of French speaking Haitians in federal public service. Many have asked, why the focus on blackness in this moment? I believe the answer to that question lies in history, our nation's history, of course, but also the history of public service. Other than as a blip, quite literally a few lines in the documented history of public service, black people appear nowhere, but we are here everywhere in this nation as we have been for centuries. One of the things I've learned from the hundreds of black and racialized public servants who've been my teachers over the last few years, both in interviews and offline conversations, is how closely they have paid attention to all that has been promised and attempted before. In fact, I've learned which task force documents, which royal commissions, which books and institutional histories, regulations, and commission studies to gather and read from these ongoing conversations. Importantly, I've learned that black public servants hold an understanding, a well articulated and observed knowledge that has been woefully untapped, under amplified and underutilized in government. This knowledge of these public servants has been acquired through stalled decades long careers through colleagues who resist and resign, and through friends who enter and then quickly leave public service for the private sector. And so while these shared narratives of resistance and exclusion do not have a royal commission to quantify and contain them, I've learned to listen very closely, more than I speak. After the First and Second World Wars, Black Canadians became veterans by the thousands, but they, they were not prioritized for preferential access for jobs in the civil service. Those positions were reserved for white veterans. Black Canadian women were a culturally diverse multitude of many thousands in 1960s Canada, and yet they were not included 
for consideration in the large scale studies then commissioned to meaningfully integrate the nation's women into public service for the first time in history. And aren't we women too? As black and women of color feminists taught the world in the 1970s and 80s through their writings and activism, the challenge with institutional change hinges on the deep rooted presumption that all the women are white and all the blacks are men. As such, black Canadian women did not benefit from the affirmative action initiatives that were created for white women in public service. During the quiet revolution, francophones were also a culturally and racially diverse multitude of thousands in this nation. Yet the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism set out as its authors wrote to develop the Canadian Confederation partnership on the basis of an equal partnership between the two founding races, both understood to be white. Thus, thousands of Black Canadian Francophones remained beyond the national imaginary and outside of public service. As a dear mentor, an elder historian who studies Black migration in the 19th century once said to me, we can understand what people believed and valued by paying close attention to what they did how they behaved, follow the bodies, Rachel. Canada's body of founding violence lies in the histories of slavery and settler colonialism, two systems of domination that have uniquely and without rival or reproduction shaped the lives of black and indigenous peoples for centuries. And the lineage of these founding forms of violence has endured within all of our nation's institutions. Public service is not an outlier or an exception. There are many, many moments in the history of our nation's public service when black Canadians should have been included. We too are veterans, women, French speaking, and we are queer and disabled and working class. Recently, reports, strategies, demographic data and legislation have been created to reckon with the exclusion of people with disabilities and LGBTQ2 plus people from public service. This ongoing work is necessary and urgent. And as this work moves forward, we must be deliberate about understanding how racism shapes other areas of equity and inclusion work too. To be explicit, in this crucial moment, we must be very careful not to replicate the past with the biased presumption that all disabled people, all LGBTQ plus people are white. Here is what I know. As a black, cis queer, neurodiverse woman from a working class rural family, only one of those identities would have certainly precluded my career in public service over the last century. I, I know this because I followed my mentor's advice. I have paid close attention to what has been done, how public service has behaved since it began. I have indeed followed the bodies. So that is the answer to why blackness needs its own focus, its own attention, its own study, its own legs at this moment in the history of public service, follow the bodies. This is the best way, I believe, to do what the call to action urges public servant leaders to do. And that is to encourage and support the voices that have been long marginalized in our organization, to create opportunities where they have long been absent. We must take direct practical actions to invoke change. This is a true test of leadership and one we must head on now. Thank you.
Welcome everyone, bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Je m'appelle John Metcalf, je suis l'enseignant en chef à l'école de la France. My name is John Metcalf, I'm the head teacher and I'm going to be your moderator for today's discussion following the presentation of the Dr. Salas. Avant que nous ne commencions, je sais to acknowledge that I'm participating in this event from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And I know that many of you may be joining us from various parts of the country and would therefore encourage you to pause for a moment to recognize and acknowledge the territory that you are occupying. We appreciate all of you being with us here today for the Jocelyn Bourgon Visiting Scholar Lecture. The time is now for Black Canadians in the public service. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share the virtual stage today with our three panelists. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Zellers, as well as Paula Folks Delaire and Gavin Cadat for what I'm sure will be a thought provoking discussion. Um, Dr. Zellers est la chercheur invitée à l'École de la fonction publique du Canada. Elle est avocate agrégée supérieure de recherche et professeure adjointe du département. Visiting scholar at the Canada School of Public Service and is working at the St. Mary's University. Paula Faust Daller is the Director General in Washington Sector Public Services and Procurement Canada in the Embassy of Canada to the United States. And Gavin Cadat is the Vice President, Policy and Communication Sector, Public Service Commun Commission of Canada. Welcome. So to start our discussion today, we can have a question for Dr. Zellers. Dr. Zellers, je me rappelle qu'une de... Join the school, and you spoke about the important research you wanted to undertake while in your role uh, as visiting scholar. And so could you maybe help frame our conversation today by telling us why you chose this topic for your focus and what you hope it will be useful for both now and maybe in the future? Yes, absolutely. You know, um, a few days ago, I opened uh, the New York Times as I do most mornings when I have my coffee and I immediately noticed this, this beautiful front page story about the, the history of Haiti, the revolution, but also the cost that the nation was forced to pay for freeing itself. And so it feels timely now, always timely, to invoke the name of, of Haitian historian uh, Michel Rolf Trouillot, uh, who taught me this for our purposes today. He taught me that history is the fruit of power, right? History is, is the fruit of power, and that the ultimate mark of power uh, lies in its invisibility. So when I began my, my tenure last fall as a research fellow, one of the things I was immediately struck with was a series of familiar related questions that I began to hear everywhere I turned. When the subject of the call to action arose, so too did concerns about things like affirmative action, targets, quotas. And one leader um, bluntly asked this question in a meeting that has stayed with me, what about the people, right? What about the people who will not be promoted if we promote indigenous, black, and other racialized employees, right? Of course, the people, the people that I understood this leader to be referencing to with such interest and concern are white public servants, the status quo. And so I became really curious about the timing of these questions that coincided with this historic call to action and the work that departments were collectively undertaking to make public service a better place for black racialized and indigenous public servants. These questions have two important things in common. First and foremost, they all relate back to this question of merit, the, the principle of merit in public service. But as someone who has spent a, literally a lifetime studying the way that power and whiteness behaves in this part of the world, I recognized a familiar second theme, a fear that something is now being taken away or diminished, and that those who have maintained power and position for so long are now poised to lose some of both. The, the fear is really familiar to me because over the last century, wherever nor racial minorities in North America have struggled for greater equity, 
white fear and resistance has followed. This is not at all hyperbole, but rather a historical pattern. And so I started reading backwards in time, that's how I describe it, through the history of public service, through its reports, its royal commissions, to see what fruits of power I could find inside of an invisible history, right, that no one had written about before. And that is the, the history of, of the merit principle and its relationship to Black people in Canada. I learned three important things as I was reading back in time. First, at first, I learned that the merit principle is really just that. It's a principle. It's a concept with guiding ideas about who best belongs in public service. It's never been fixed in stone. In fact, over the last century, it has been malleable, uh, deeply unstable, used in a discriminatory fashion even, and, and stretched as widely as possible in its meaning to make space for those that public service has unjustly excluded in the past. I, I learned that public service has a long tradition of using preferential hiring affirmative action targets and quotas to address and, and redress its own history of discrimination. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I learned that public service was always committed to white bodies as the norm. Uh, initially male bodies, right, but later through the advocacy work of second wave feminists in the 60s, white women too, white women too. And then thirdly, I learned how hard public service has worked over the last century, clearly, intentionally, to keep public service white, and specifically to ignore the racist treatment of Black Canadians. And, and so with my research, uh, I learned that the ultimate mark of power in public service very much lies within this hidden history. Um, this history matters profoundly, and, and I want to I want to explain why it matters profoundly. Not because merit is sexy, or because merit is is meaningful as some long-standing or or cherished value. Rather, this history matters, right? Because what is most telling, what wields the most power in history, are actually the stories that are not told, right? The stories that have been excluded and silenced, the tens of thousands, now millions of Black people who have been ignored by this country's largest employer since civil service began. These stories, these exclusions reveal a version of the history of public service that few, if any, Canadians have ever heard before. And uh, it's also one that is much more truthful than the other versions that currently exist. Um, it's also a history I deeply, deeply believe that has to be revealed and spoken and widely shared and known throughout public service in order to accomplish what the call to action uh, sets out to achieve. So to go back to where we started with your question, I want people to understand the structure of whiteness embedded within the long history of public service, absolutely. And a study of merit really illuminates that structure beautifully. I also want people to see what structural racism in practice looks like in public service. And importantly, I want public servants to understand that preferential hiring, affirmative action, targets and quotas have always, always been used to address histories of exclusion and discrimination in public service, because that is what equity means. That is what equity demands. These kinds of, of practices and experimentations are also very much what public service uh, must do to become more equitable for Black, racialized, uh, and Indigenous Canadians. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Zellers. Uh, je vais maintenant inviter... Zellers. I'm now, I'm now going to invite Gavin and Paula to share their conclusions, either about what you heard by Dr. Zellers or based on your own experience in the public service. And Gavin, I'm going to start with you. Thank you very much. I would like to recognize that I'm uh, talking to you from the Ashnabi territory. First of all, Dr. Zellers, Rachel, 
your research is so important, so impressive. And while listening some of the points, I've I was really struck by some ideas. First of all, I think the argument that was uh, often brought up is that we could just open the access and find the system and use the merit system. And if the people are have, have enough merit and that the system allows them to apply, maybe that would uh, suppress the representation problem. But if we look at history, we can see that this point of view is clearly false and we need more positive measures to uniform to for the uniformization of the chances for the black Canadians. It's really important to uh, uh, to highlight that we've seen that the the groups don't stay represented in a fair manner and their opportunity of employment diminished significant, significantly. Another point that you brought up it, with your remarks, Rachel, that really brought up my attention is that even when the public service is turned to the idea of having a more representative population, including French Canadian, uh, French people, indigenous people, it's only decades later that the that representation is is thought of for black people. Et je pense qu'une chose qui a vraiment résonné pour moi for decade upon decades merit how it was defined implicitly and explicitly and how it was assessed uh, had been decided by those who held power and privilege and as Luc Juliette and Ken Rasmussen's book entitled Defending the Contested Ideal. A system that was creating barriers for many Canadians. So, you know, if we go all the way back to like 1882 and in, in the review of the, of the Civil Service Act, um, the notion of merit meant that meritorious candidates had to have the means to pay to take the public service entry exam. They were male, they were without disability, uh, they were of morally upstanding character as vouched for by an influential member of the community. You know, this determination of merit and how it would be assessed excluded Black Canadians. And then, you know, you fast forward and into the 1970s and you know, it was reflected in, you know, men not seeing women's work experience as being equal because it was gained outside of the professional work environment, an environment from which women were often barred. And it took the PSC, you know, writing a directive that explicitly told hiring managers to give the same weight to women's experience gained through volunteering uh, as they would to men's work experience gained through paid work. And that started to bring about, you know, change. And so today there's this explicit, you know, call to action on anti-racism, equity and inclusion in the federal public service, calling upon leaders to take actions that will lead to systemic change by appointing black people to and within the executive group, sponsoring and preparing black uh, public servants for leadership roles, supporting and recruiting black people across all the regions of Canada. And this call really recognizes that the playing field is yet to be leveled and fair for black people. And you know, just pulling from my own lived experience, I realized this very early in my career um, that my very blackness in and of itself would be seen as unprofessional. I would be fighting this bias my whole career. And, you know, as an example, it came, you know, first when a manager I really respected, really looked at, looked up to, uh, looked at me one day and, and told me that I looked more professional after I changed my hair style to a long sort of bone straight hairstyle instead of wearing my natural coils to work. And this has repeated itself through many microaggressions, including once being told, you know, I was the perfect shade of brown, making me wonder how professional I would be deemed after summer vacation. So, you know, this brings back some of that sort of lived experience and as you go through that history. And I would say that the, the, the last thing that struck me in listening to your talk, Rachel, and just preparing for today's panel,
is the point that you made about merit sometimes being used as a caution against increasing diversity. And en tant qu'une personne qui a passé une grande partie de sa carrière dans le domaine de ressources part humaines. Part of my career in the human resources field, I found very important differences in the way people adapt the requirements to include uh, people from racialized backgrounds. And this is always raising questioning about the quality of the talent and this is, is not funded. This is not uh, something that should, that should be because there are a lot of very qualified people in those communities. And I think this, those fears without, without foundation are preventing us to, to have a more equitable environment for the black people. Et je vais laisser la parole à Paula pour la suite. Merci, j'aimerais tout d'abord reconnaître que je suis honorée d'être sur le territoire de D.C. Tout d'abord, je crois que Mme Zellers a marqué l'histoire avec son exposé aujourd'hui. C'est la toute première fois que les personnes... I wanted to acknowledge the fact that Dr. Zellers made history with her speech today. It's the first time people address merit um, in that way. This portrait based on very meticulous research shows us how merit has been exploited to for, to benefit some of some people and exclude black people what was most important to me is how merit has been used as a as something very malleable during history that was making the road easier for some and harder for others never it has been employed as something positive allowing to promote equity for Black Canadians. Le mérite a été appliqué dans le sens as an objective or absolute standard that can be safely navigated towards, but rather a conveniently malleable concept um, that has been defined and redefined and adapted according to the desires of the status quo. The merit system was not designed to reward the individual performance of people from all skin colors and all walks of life. When it was first applied in pre-colonial times, merit was about how to more evenly distribute the desirable civil service positions among the so-called nobles or ruling classes to replace nepotism and the system of spoils. It was about making sure those groups who already had power and privilege retained it. Following the First World War, we see that merit was reimagined in order to help some groups, for example, women and veterans, but never black women or black veterans. And just as Rachel mentioned, merit has been used intentionally to exclude Black people from the public service at the very times throughout history when our skills, education, knowledge, work ethic, lived and professional experiences were desperately needed. Now, of course, notions of which skills and abilities are meritorious can and should change over time to make for an ever more qualified and performant public service. We are in a digital age. We have a knowledge-based economy. We have higher levels of education across the population than ever before. The competencies and abilities assessed as part of merit shouldn't be static, but merit should never be defined or applied in such a way as to disadvantage equity and merit deserving groups. A merit system calls for differences in performance to be the basis for allocating the rewards, such as hiring and promotion, rather than other non-merit factors but there is an inherent assumption that performance occurs on a level playing field, which we know it does not. And so a person from a racialized or marginalized group who performs well does so in spite of the systemic racism and discrimination that exists. Instead of this performance being seen as even more merit deserving because of the circumstances under which it was attained, other artificial non-performance based criteria and biases, both explicit and implicit, are inserted into the selection process in place of performance. 
This is done to allow those who hold power to make for non-performance-based choices about who wins and who loses within the system. It allows for setting aside high performance in the merit decision in order to pursue sameness, which is seen as less risky because it's familiar and comfortable and well-known. Perhaps the best example from my lived experience is my first job in government, where I was recruited as an ES category, which is now EC. Um, after uh, a year, you're eligible for a promotion following an assessment of competencies. The competencies were rated out of seven, and my supervisor, finding my performance exceptional, gave me mostly sevens out of sevens and six out of sevens. My assistant director, I believe it was my director at the time, asked my supervisor to lower the scores. And my supervisor didn't understand why he would do such a thing because my supervisor was most knowledgeable about my work. And the director said, well, no one is that good. And I think what he really meant was no black person is that good. And so my supervisor being a person of high values and ethics refused to lower the scores as the director asked. And so the director took it upon himself to lower the scores on the last page of my assessment booklet. And then my supervisor decided to uh, write a dissenting opinion. And I still have that paper somewhere locked away in a box in storage in Ottawa. And sometimes I look back and say, look how far I've come over the last 20 years. And I would love to just post it on the wall so I could look at it as I get ready in the morning and get ready to face a day. But I won't do that because I don't want my children to see it. I want them to believe that public service is an employer of choice for all Canadians, including black Canadians. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paula. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Dr. Zellers for these powerful opening reflections that will set the stage for our conversation today. Uh, let me maybe open our panel discussion with a, a question that grounds us in the rich history that Dr. Zellers shared with us and that both Gavin and Paula cited in, in their opening remarks. Um, one of the things that really struck me from today's lecture was its exploration on how deeply rooted these discriminatory concepts of merit are in the history of the public service, in our institutions, in our documents. And it was fascinating to look at how this concept has evolved over the course of our national history. So my question to the three of you would be to ask, where do you see diversity in relation to merit? And what does the relationship between merit and diversity over the last century reveal about its application? And maybe Gavin, I'll invite you to, to have the first word on this one. Sure, that's a great question. Um, I see diversity and merit as inseparable. Now, I mean, the PSEA and the public, well, the Public Service Employment Act, you know, builds this concept into the meaning of merit and how it's applied. It's an, it's newer, um, but this merit, the merit is meant now to be inclusionary, um, and this changed in in 2005 uh, when the PSEA was amended to include a definition of of merit. Um, so it took hundreds of years to do it, but there it is. Um, and so it now means that, you know, a person needs to meet essential qualifications, including official languages, um, but also asset qualifications. But importantly, current and future needs as defined by the public service. And as stated in the preamble of the PSEA, a representative public service is a desired outcome. And now we see this often as part of uh, being built into merit criteria, this organizational need to have representation uh, of designated groups. So, you know, as an institution, you know, the public service needs to be representative of the, of the population in Canada. And uh, there's a commitment now in the most recent changes to the PSEA that that the government of Canada is, is committed to an inclusive public service that's representative of Canada's uh, diversity. So, you know, as Paula mentioned in, in Dr. Zeller's and in, in Rachel's research, you know, merit has been an evolving concept and it's grown to include building a diverse team. It now recognizes that managers are not just hiring for the position, but for the organization who will make the best team. 
and, and we know from data it's in, and research, it's 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 known now that you know diverse teams are the most productive teams. Uh, je dirais également qu'il faut aller au-delà de la diversité et, et viser également l'inclusion pour vraiment say, avoir. Uh, also say that we need to to reach for inclusion. The rules of the game have to be equal for the black candidates and. Et tu sais, Rachel, ta recherche, mon... Which originally defined and applied, it was meant to exclude black people. It was not envisioned for decades upon decades that black people would be part of a professional, nonpartisan public service. And so this is why when we talk about systemic racism, we have to recognize this history and that the untold history. Um, and the call to action itself recognizes that racism is in our institutions, uh, even with you know the noble principle of merit from its inception in 1908 to decades later, it's failed uh, as a system in building a representative public service. Rather, it the system prioritized white middle-class males without disabilities. So the work is underway to redistribute this power across everybody in society and in the public service as an institution so that there really is that level playing field. And, you know, last July, the Public Service Employment Act, uh, as I mentioned, was, was amended and now, you know, has this explicit commitment. So, you know, it's time for us as leaders to really act upon that, really understand the history behind, you know, how this came to be in the system, but what we need to do uh, in, in order to change that. Great, thank you, Gavin. Paul, anything you'd wanna add on this question? Absolutely, John. Um, so, so Rachel highlighted in her lecture how black women from English speaking Caribbean nations were recruited to come to Canada as domestic workers from 1955 to 1967. And this was done to fill a domestic labor shortage as white Canadian women were increasingly working outside of the home. Black domestic workers were paid less than anticipated and worked longer hours than most. And their many contributions to the cultural, economic, societal progress of Canada during those years was not well known or celebrated. And the true potential of many of those workers was never realized, but we know of one. Beaucoup de gens ne savent pas que l'honorable Jean Augustine, qui a immigré de Grenade au Canada en 1960, après avoir terminé son année de travail en tant que domestique, est inscrit à l'Université de Toronto. Er, er, bachelor and her studies in Toronto before becoming uh, the first black Canadian woman elected at the common chamber in 1982. Certain women are still experiencing the impact of such systems. According to the labor force survey supplement in 2021, black female workers were mostly concentrated in the healthcare and social assistance industry with 33.8% reporting a job in this industry. It's 11.3 percentage points higher than the rest of the employed female population at only 22.5%. The same factors leading to this gap underpin the underrepresentation of black employees in the federal public service, in my view. We find black federal employees more frequently at entry and working levels, and we see reduced representation at managerial and executive levels. The perception of merit, of who should receive the rewards, who should hold power, who deserves to serve, is informed by thousands of years of beliefs about elitism and supremacy. Today, we should ask ourselves, what abilities are we really evaluating when we select who can serve and lead? What abilities do we truly value when selecting who will ascend the ranks? It is not surprising that those who hold power have defined merit and apply it in a way that benefits the historical existing power structure. This self-perpetuating system of self-preservation bears merit out of the rules and norms and historical archetypes of who is power deserving. Public service has always been a desirable and noble profession, a profession in high demand and high regard. Public service is power. No matter what group and level you hold, 
the ability to make decisions that affect thousands or maybe millions of lives with a single signature. C'est très, très, très important à ce point dans l'histoire. And at this point in history that we avoid at all costs that the merit is can be used more efficiently that is that is bred aware that it's being used against indigenous and black community we have to cease it we cannot ignore anymore that the black population as a group as an ensemble is highly qualified that is adept and able to not only be part of the public function but also to lead in that in that way thank you Merci. thank you paula where the latest thinking is paul has shared with us some some moving stories but also some data and statistics and key questions anything you'd like to add to this conversation here Oh man, maybe just quickly, a few things quickly. I mean, historically, it became clear for me doing research, reading everything, different, you know, studies. Of course, I mentioned some royal commissions up front that are embedded into my research. It, it just became clear that public service and the notion of merit, it, it meant white. It did not, it, it did not mean excellent for large parts of our history. It meant white. And it meant specifically finding ways to include white veterans white women, uh, white French Quebecers. And in the process of doing that, um, this is something that um, Luc Juliette and Ken uh, Rasmussen point out in their book that Gavin mentioned, in, in the process of doing that, they tackled disability, right? In the context of veterans' preferences. Again, disabled, the early conceptions of disability and who constituted a vener veteran in public service, it meant white. Um, public service was able to confront sexism and patriarchy, you know, in its integration of women into public service. Again, um, you know, not only the struggles around sexism and patriarchy, but the group of women that public service valued and studied, it imagined to be white. Um, and then in the case of French Quebecers, tackling the issue of linguistic discrimination, other kinds of discrimination um, in, in, in the history of Quebec and in its, you know, relationship to uh, you know, the British Empire and the sort of dueling system of colonialism uh, between the French and British, you know, it imagined those struggles um, and the kind of linguistic discrimination that the, that the quiet revolution and French Quebecers made central to, to, their, to their work in that period of history, public service um, saw whiteness in those struggles, in, the, in that advocacy, in those bodies. Um, and so that, you know, just, just as one example, I mean, Paula touched on this. Thank you so much for, for, for mentioning that history. You know, one example that really sticks with me is in the 60s and 70s, you know, public service truly did move mountains to make space for women. Um, and these are women who had little to no previous work or career experience. That's very important. They were women who became leaders in public service, women who became deputy ministers in public service. And within a very, very short period of time, women came to represent more than 50% of all public servants. But as Gavin pointed out, these women were white. They were not the tens of thousands of black Canadians who were organizers, who were mothers, who were domestics, who were professionals, who made our educational institutions and our schools, our public schools, excellent who cleaned wealthy white Canadians' homes, who built their communities, right? Um, in fact, we know that black women were nowhere to be found in the two major studies that public service relied upon, right? To move the needle forward in terms of policy and values for white women. Um, so, you know, in short, um, you know, it's important to study back to see how intentional these, intentional the exclusion of Black Canadians was in public service. Yeah, thank you for that reflection. And, uh, you know, all three of you went back and spoke about some of these primary source documents that many of us have never had the opportunity or, you know, the, we haven't gone to go back and, and look into those documents. And what we're seeing is really, I think, changing our perspective on what merit means.
And the history is so important. Alors, à la, à la lumière de cette histoire, qu'est-ce que History, what exactly does this signify for the recruiting, recruitment and the retention of Black Canadians in public functions? And Paula, I'll start with you on that. Thank you, John. I'm going to continue with the stats, the stats that I, because I love stats and facts and data. In 2021, age 25 to 54, held a bachelor's degree or higher compared to 34.2% of the same of Black Canadians in the federal public service, not an under-representation. Aussi, je dois dire que... Um, say that the census of 2016 indicates about 5% is higher than the general population that the English, French is spoken in the house. We try, we're trying to buy, build a public function that is bilingual. Why are we not able to do that? Why don't we do that with the recruitment campaigns adapted to, why are we creating more obstacle for black Francophone Canadians? Assessing of four Canadian Noir, en tant que graduate, tu as sûrement fait l'université au Canada ou l'université, tu as sûrement gradué avec un diplôme ou un degré. They are still having a hard time entering and rising within the federal public service because of the way that merit is differentially applied today and because of, of a lack of clear strategies that could be applied to close the representation and inclusion gaps, the same way we did for women over the last 70 years. Though there is still work to do, especially at executive levels and in STEM professions. Rachel and, and Gavin have both touched on how volunteer experience, for example, was counted as part of the merit equation when the government wanted more women in clerical staff. Just as we found a way to devise the right strategy to increase the representation of women in government, I think we can do the same for Black Canadians. But we run the risk of continuing this history today. And I say this because, at titre d'exemple, les personnes ayant des besoins. People that are having are needing flexibility. People that have different ca capacities, they're not well represented in public functions. They're not deployed to fix this problem in, for the president. Would, we should not forget that there are other people that are handicapped and black that are also, that are more mar marginalized, even more marginalized that need equity. So we have a real is an important concept that we need to understand and embrace. Nous devons le comprendre et l'appliquer, l'utiliser pour orienter nos stratégies liées à l'équité, à l'inclusion et à la lutte contre le racisme. J'aimerais que toutes les grandes décisions que nous prenons en lien avec les... that we make it in relations with the public and the, the laws that are creating and the services that we're offering are part of the project that we, based on the uptake, based on analysis on the laws, and also it will see program and service decisions. Cela nous aiderait à mettre en lumière et à atténuer les différentes shed light on the differences and the potential practice, uh, governmental practice, so that the Black community 
in the public function outside of our sector. Thank you, Paula, for the date. Le donner this book in leadership positions just do better is is so needed. Uh, Gavin, qu'est-ce que cela signifie pour le recrutement et la rétention des, des Canadiens noirs dans la fonction publique et aussi peut-être comment pouvons-nous aller de l'avant lorsque ces critères invisibles sont well, when those criteria are embedded in the system in the recruiting system, I would say. Premièrement, je Alice has said in terms of you know the need to apply that a black centric lens and think about intersectionality as well as the compounded realities. We have to understand the realities and lived experiences of, of black candidates and make sure our processes account for these. And I've said this a few times, but I believe it deplete, deeply that in order to make merit you know, more meaningful, we need to recognize that the playing field isn't leveled and we need to change the system to make it more even. And nous ne pouvons pas continuer to use the same recruitment approach and hope to have different results. As the research that we did that Rachel uh, highlighted in her speech, we taking seriously the represent women representation in public services. And also, like I said previously, in the hiring management that they virilize experience and for women that have uh, a experience and also the the memory qualifications and the way they they obtain that and they, the, it was demonstrated it was different donc je pense you know the recruitment of, of black people and other racialized people too is we need to challenge ourselves as hiring managers and as participants on on assessment boards you know are we undervaluing leadership experience that's gained if it's outside the public service for black candidates if it's in a community organization if it's volunteer work if it's experience outside of canada uh, do we have a predefined notion of what professional looks like is it narrow or is it inclusive you know are we open to work being accomplished differently uh, to to, to people expressing their ideas differently? Are we misconstru misconstruing the, the concept of organizational culture fit and conflating it with having a, a, a homogeneous group? You know, when organizational fit is really about, is it really an inclusive concept about bringing in perspective, experience and ideas that aren't a direct reflection of everyone else uh, in the team. So, you know, these are important reflections we need to be doing to put our unconscious bias training to action. Uh, il existe d'excellents exemples d'approches de recrutement adaptées afin de mieux attirer des candidats noirs, uh, comme la campagne More adapted to recruit the black community better and uh, the national defense and also the student recruiting for the visible RDC and also to recruit black students and the networks that are about leadership prof profiles and the intern and also what's next to the public functions that are the laws about aiming equitable opportunities and using different evaluation methods and the prejudices and the different so everything that we're evaluating and the tools and how we apply them so we're they're aiming to the procedure of inclusive procedure and how to eliminate obstacles from this from start and last it is important and uh, I mean, we did see a sort of that quicker rise of of um you know women leaders uh, and we're seeing sort of that balanced representation and you know the people who are making hiring decisions those that are shaping merit criteria and assessing candidates we that population you know, needs to be a diverse one and we have to work towards that Thank you, Yavin. Some some powerful and practical questions in your response there. Uh, Dr. Zeller, is anything you would like to add, having gotten to know the public service as you have over the past months? Um, thank you so, so, so much. Um, we need a, a good plan of action. And, you know, 
I think that we're, you know, as I like sort of step back and looked at all that I've, all that I've learned, I really believe that we are at the problem identification stage. We have a problem there. So I would say, you know, nous devons commencer par nous assurer que les gens comprennent vraiment. People really understand the problems. On est vraiment justement à cette place de comprendre c'est quoi exactement le problème. Donc juste par question de temps, je vais juste m'en a lot about data in this moment, uh, collecting, figuring out what to do with um, the most hyper disaggregated data sets that public service has ever seen. And um, I've been paying close attention to some of the departments that are getting that like fine data, you know, whereby visible minority categories are disaggregated um, and disaggregated by category. So by you know, the feeder categories or EX categories in some cases, you know, you can count those positions on one hand, not even two hands. Um, so one of the most important things just with respect to data, that's really the problem stage, like assessing it, making sure we're all on the same page with respect to data is, you know, we need to, we need to, public service has to do a better job at establishing parameters and collecting data that can be used to specifically assess underrepresentation and stagnation, you know, such as uh, the work that Martin Nicholas has been doing with his disproportionality index. You know, just briefly, the reason that his his work and his research is so important is because a disproportionality index is it compares the percentage the percentage representation of an equity group, black employees, for a particular salary range to the overall average value throughout public service. And that's the kind of specificity uh, that we just really need in this moment that, um, uh, that I still see uh, leaders uh, and departments not paying enough attention to. So uh, I could say so much more about that, but I know we only have an hour, so I'll pause here. Thank you. And you know, grounding us in this idea that we are at the problem definition phase, I think really, um, sets up very nicely or, or or builds on, maybe I should say, what Paula and Gavin were saying about what we need to do going forward. So maybe I'll just offer each of you an opportunity to, to comment on, on that quickly. You know, what is the way forward? How do we support the career progression of Black public servants if we are only at this problem definition stage and we have these calls to do better uh, that Paula and Gavin have shared. So Paula, let me start with you on this one. Well, thanks, John. <clears throat> so in terms of how we can support the career progression of black uh, public servants, you know, we've talked a lot already in other Canada school discussions about mentorship and sponsorship. Uh, which are critically important tools to ensuring that talented black and equity seeking groups have a chance to make their best contribution to the public service. In a nutshell, mentorship is really about guiding you and focusing on developing your best self. And sponsorship involves a leader speaking about you and helping you network and getting you out in the world for new opportunities and experiences. But beyond mentorship and sponsorship, we need to use the public service human resources tools that already exist to appoint black and indigenous employees as the clerk has instructed us to do. And we need to create the supports needed for diverse employees to experience inclusion in the government. This means better data on inclusion. New questions on inclusion must be added to the public service employee survey with adequate disag disaggregation to understand the black experience specifically. These need to be presented in dashboards and other useful formats so that decision makers can take evidence-based decisions. Diversity networks also need to be equipped with dedicated resources, not volunteers doing the work on the side of their desks. Most of the progress being made inside departments on diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism today is being done by these networks and secretariats and allies and key roles across a handful of departments. So funding diversity networks is funding our future. Um, je suis ravie 
que nous avons un, un appel d'action et, et que c'était lancé au sein du gouvernement fédéral. La fonction publique fédérale a fait preuve d'un grand... The, the public service has made proof of great courage. They've opened the door to conversation are really necessary. And the Sioux ministers about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It allowed us to put, shed light on what that needed to be done when it comes to political side. It leaves a great marge of, to maneuver and on the way that it was put in place in, co in the respective departments. And I think now it is time to evaluate the way that it was interpreted by the ministry and to examine the progress that was realized to this day. So we have to make sure that we are transparent on the way that we are explaining on what has been done and what hasn't been done in the midst of different ministries. And the ministerial ap approach needs to be watched and put in place when it comes to results for the public function. And also it was greatly useful to obtain a coherent image on progress and other things that were laid on the and the report of the parliament on the action appeal. So we have to hold ourselves accountable. If not, the public function will stay, uh, will have a different face than the, than the Canadian population itself that they're serving and they will, that they will continue to serve, which will translate eventually to a lack of confidence in the government. Et avec ça, je voudrais juste... Um, we do need more disaggregated data to support performance measurement strategies and to ensure that the story of Black, Indigenous, and other racialized and marginalized Canadians is told. Because of anti-Black racism and xenophobia specifically, we need a Black version of the Many Voices, One Mind report that was done for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada. We need a Royal Commission inquiry and report on Blackness in the federal public service and in Canada. And John, this one's for you. We need to look more closely at transferable skills, which is something I know you worked on for a very long time and is part of your areas of expertise. My theory is that if you've dealt with racism your whole life, from peers and teachers, and grocery store clerks and maintained your composure, you're probably somebody who can deal with difficult clients. If you've worked in the private sector as a legal assistant, I see the same exact skills and use in the public sector as administrative assistants. If you've read financial statements and conducted budgeting and forecasting in the private sector, I see no reason why you can't do that in the public sector. We need to change our thinking about who deserves merit and who can do the public service jobs that we have available. And I would offer that we should entirely rethink our statement of merit criteria and how these are developed and applied in the federal public service. In almost every statement of merit criteria, I see something to the effect of recent, one star, and significant, two stars, experience providing strategic advice and recommendations to senior management, three stars, <laughs> where senior management is defined as, and this is the three stars, director level and above, or even director general level and above. But if you have a manager that blocks your access to your director, or doesn't incorporate your advice or recommendations, then you'll never meet that essential criteria. And the reason why you won't meet it might have nothing to do with your abilities. Wow, thank you, Paula. Um, Gavin, I'm going to put the same question to you. I don't know what I could add to that list. I don't know what I could add to that. That was a superb list. Like I have like the same list, so I don't want to duplicate all of that. But Paula, you ended on that inclusive merit criteria point, and I couldn't 
be more happier to hear that because that's something, you know, when we talk about um, some of the changes to our own legislation around how merit will now be assessed and 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 how we have to uh, now uh, or will when when it comes into force have to assess the tools we're using for bias and barriers. You know what we're really trying to say is yeah that's great and we need to do that. But more importantly is build your your staffing process to be inclusive from the start. Think about your staffing about who uh, who out there can be part of the public service. So how we write the merit criteria, what we define is a key piece to that. Um, and so thanks for, for highlighting that. Um, you mentioned data and disaggregated data, I agree. And concrete plans that really that we can look forward and that accountability uh, as well around marking that progress and really having the data to say where we're we doing well, where we're not. Um, maybe I'll take, um, just not to repeat, maybe I'll take my remarks a little bit more uh, to maybe um, my lived experience side, to uh, mentioné le parrainage, et c'est quelque chose qui a été fait par sponsorship and how and people that are, that were in public services position and how it's really an interaction that has to be uh, shared with everyone. So it, it's something that was done for and by the people. And they, they, they got positions of power. And I would say that for me, for and with people who were my sponsors. You know, I recall a time when I was a PE3 and my colleagues, I didn't know they did this, went to the ADM and advocated for me to, to lead a special project. Not just lead it, but to get paid for it too, that I should get acting pay. You know, many of my bosses found a way, an excuse to get me in the room where decisions were being made so that I had exposure to senior level discussions. And often without my knowledge and after, and often learning after the fact, my supervisors advocated for me for development opportunities for special projects that would get me exposure, connecting me to people within their network. They saw my talent, they saw my results and my potential and they actively sponsored me. Donc, you know, à ce moment de, de ma carrière, je veux donner au suivant. Career, I wanted to give back to the next and give to the employees that are racialized, racialized and for the people that are at worst mentoring to make sure that if you look at Petrograda Kitsu. I really ask yourself, is it a diverse group of people? It really should be. And that's what the call to action is asking us to do. It's an imperative. Merci beaucoup, Gavin. Thank you for sharing some of your personal experience. And thank you for using the word accountability, which is something I think we all need to embrace if we're really going to undertake these actions with, with meaning. Um, je vais peut-être poser une dernière question à, à Dr. Zellers. Je vais poser la dernière question à Dr. Zellers. But firstly, I would want to take a moment to thank you, Dr. Zellers, for everything that you brought to the public services, the public functions, that the first researchers that was invited to the school. You have inspired us. You have compelled us to take action. And maybe if I could just ask one question at the close of your tenure as the uh, inaugural Justin Bourgon visiting scholar, maybe two questions, actually. First, what is your message to all public servants? And second, what is your message to black public servants in particular? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I have to start with black public servants. Thank you. Merci, merci, merci de m'avoir permis d'écouter et de prendre. Curing me, thank you for helping me, for giving us time for all the hard days of work and en partageant des... 1 a.m. Uh, sometimes on a Sunday. Thank you for your experiences, for trusting me enough to know what to do with them. Thank you, Gavin and Paula, for always, always making time for me, uh, for teaching me, and, and, and for representing a brilliant, intelligent, compassionate model of leadership uh, that I firmly believe uh, public service can no longer survive without. So truly, Um, thank you to the heartfelt leaders uh, in public service. Those, there are a few deputy ministers retired who've, who've truly shown me what embodied and wise leadership looks like. Um, and I would be amiss if I didn't mention my team at the Canada School of Public Service, 
I've had an opportunity to work with this group um, over the last year for whom the guiding belief is selflessness. Uh, my team at, that, at the school embodies this kind of, of selfless leadership to the core. And I would be, of course, amiss if I did not mention uh, Aisha Tutoré, who has been day in and day out with a toddler on her lap, uh, just a rock and a friend. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zellers. Ceci conclut notre événement pour aujourd'hui. Events for today. Thank you, everyone. Gavin. Thank you, Paul. Paula, thank you, Dr. Zellers. This discussion that was really important and moving. We really appreciate. On apprécie vraiment. And speak to us. Uh, pour ceux et celles qui ont, ont participé à l'événement. That are participating in the event, I really appreciate. I hope you guys appreciated it, and we hope that your interaction is really important to us. So, complete the evaluation. The electronic, the evaluation online that we will see in the next few days. Once again, thank you very much and have a great day, everyone.